Yeah, as David said, um, we're continuing this week our theme of gospel on tour. Um, last week, we were looking at Paul's visit to Cyprus, um, which was part of Paul's first missionary journey. And today, we're going to jump forward. We're going to be jumping a bit backward and forward over the coming weeks to some of the different journeys Paul did. But we're going to look at his second missionary journey, during which time he visits the city of Corinth that Jackie has read to us about. All of these stories can be found in the book of Acts in the New Testament. And I'd like to encourage you, if you've never done that before, why not sit down and read the whole book of Acts in one go? Um, it will help you understand the series. You can add it to your holiday reading list if you have that. And I would suggest using a modern translation or a translation you've not used before. <clears throat> Acts is actually a good read. It's a story that's easy to read, and it's a story about the early church. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we have this verse that describes how the early church, through the power of the Holy Spirit, started in Jerusalem, moved to the surrounding area, and then to other parts of the known world. <clears throat> the book of Acts is also entitled, and if you look at your Bible, you might see it entitled as the, book, the Acts of the Apostles. The key people, and we've got some names up here that come under this, are people like Peter, Stephen, Philip, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, and many more. These, some of these are the apostles. But somebody has quite rightly said that the book really should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because everything that happens in the early church happens and depends on the power of the Holy Spirit working through people's lives. But you know, I like the term Acts of the Apostles because what we actually see in the book of Acts is how the Spirit uses his followers despite their failings and despite their limitations. In today's story, when Paul visits Corinth, the honesty of Scripture lets us see some of Paul's struggles as through his weakness, God uses him. You know, if people ever say to you um, that the stories in the Bible are made up, this is one of the reasons that show us that these are genuine accounts. Historians point to the fact that when you're making up a story, you don't usually add in things of people's weaknesses and difficulties. You always like to make people better than they actually are. You like to make the stories, um, make people look well. So when we see scripture, historians have said, these are genuine stories. They don't have the traits of stories made up. And there are many other historical proofs that these events actually took happen. Today, as we look at Paul's story, I'd like also to talk a little bit and bring in some aspects of my own story working with Casario Mission Project over the past 18 years. And the reason I wanted to do that was because the story that I've had um, is also about God working despite people's mistakes and those of us who have been involved in the project, our own weaknesses. And one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that God wants to work in partnership for the gospel, wants us to work in partnership for the gospel. Partnership with God, being dependent on him, but partnership with other individuals and organizations rather than trying to go it alone. And also partnering with people from different cultures, working together side by side and learning from them. So as we start this story, I'm just going to build a little context of how we get to Corinth. Um, if you read Paul's second missionary journey, um, and we're going to put a little map up. Danny, put the map up. Um, maybe you can't see all of the names, but we're going to start in the top right-hand corner, a place called um, Antioch. And we're going to do a fast run through this, okay? Are you ready? Okay. 
Right, we start in Antioch, the top right-hand side, where Paul and Barnabas plan their trip. But before they go, they have a disagreement. Barnabas heads off to Cyprus with a new colleague, John Mark, and Paul links up with Silas instead. Paul and Silas have a strategy. Where there's a Christian church, let's go and encourage the believers there. Where there's a synagogue, let's go and explain to the Jews that the promised Messiah has come and he is Jesus. Where there's neither believers or Jews, let's tell people that Jesus came to set all people free from sin and death. So they travel overland, first north, then east, through Syria and Cilicia, and there they meet churches of believers preaching as they go. Then into the sort of top center of the map, they go through Derby and Lystra, and they pick up a new recruit, Timothy. They, as they go, they deliver a letter from the church leaders back in Jerusalem. That's down in the bottom right-hand corner. And they, as they pass by, they deliver this letter to the different churches. But then as they get further north, the Holy Spirit tells them to change direction. And rather than heading up towards the Black Sea, they go north to Troas instead. At Troas, Paul has a vision in which he hears a man from Europe, that's the top left of your picture, says, come here and help us. So they get on a boat and they cross that bit of water up to a place called Philippi. In Philippi, they meet Lydia, who's a dealer in purple, in purple clothing, and her whole family become Christians. But then they meet a demon-possessed man, a demon-possessed girl, sorry. And after casting out the demon, the girl's owners have Paul and Silas flogged and thrown into jail. While they're in jail, they have a worship time, and an earthquake happens, and all the prisoners are freed, and the jailer becomes a Christian. Then they move on to Thessalonica, top left of your map again, where more people become Christians. And a mob attack them and the, and the whole house that they're staying in. And Paul and Silas escape down to Berea. In Berea, some prominent people become Christians. But the mob has followed them down from Thessalonica. And Paul gets sent down to Athens, near the bottom left of your picture, all on his own. In Athens... Paul takes center stage at the Areopagus. More people become Christians. And Paul leaves Athens and travels to Corinth. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm tired almost going through all of that. And all of that happened in about six months, approximately. You know, mission can be amazing, exciting, even terrifying as we step out of our comfort zone going to new places. Sharon shared with us there about her experience going to new places and meeting people of different cultures. <clears throat> we meet people who are different than us. We can see the power of God changing people's lives. <clears throat> I'm sure the apostles and the disciples learned a lot about God and about others, and even about themselves, as they trusted in God to lead them and protect them. Another story. In about 2001, five women, there's a picture of them, set out on an adventure to visit a mission base in the city of Beira in Mozambique. All they had was the name of the base leader, somebody called Pastor Bonga, and an address. Only one of them spoke the language Portuguese. The base they were going to was used for discipleship training schemes where people from other countries would go and do outreach in the city. <clears throat> when the staff who first came to that base went to do outreach, they came across some street children, some orphans living in the streets, and they felt, we've got to do something about this. And they started Casariom, which is translated House of the Good Shepherd. And they began to use this house to feed the street children. Now Pastor Bonga was asking for help. And to cut a long story short, Casariom Trust was set up as a UK charity 
to raise money for a permanent center and a school. And all of that started because five women had the courage to step out of the comfort zone and to partner with somebody else who was asking for help on the other side of the world. You know, maybe God is going to call people from here, maybe more people. Some people have already gone out. Maybe as a church, God will call us in the future to partner with a mission project of our own. You know, but all of us are actually called to mission here on a doorstep in our neighborhood. Going back to Paul, when Paul arrives in Corinth, we see a change in his approach to mission. Because in Corinth, Paul experienced a different level of partnering the gospel. As you saw a minute ago, Paul arrives in Corinth on his own. <clears throat> He's left his other co-workers behind after that amazing tour around um, the whole area. The first thing Paul does, we hear, is he links up with some like-minded people, a couple called Aquila and Priscilla. They were also new to the city. They had recently arrived from Italy. And we hear that Paul used um, one of the useful skills he has. He was somebody who made tents. And Aquila and Priscilla were in that trade and he began to work in their business. So as a result, Paul's preaching and teaching was now became a weekend thing because during the work, he was work, during the week, he was working as a tent maker. We don't exactly know what was behind this, but one reason for that change may have been that he'd used up all the money that was given by other churches to send him as a missionary and therefore he had to work. We, we hear later um, that when Paul writes a letter to the Corinthians, he says he didn't want, when he arrived, he didn't want to burden them with supporting him. And it, we hear later there were some significant money issues in the church, and maybe that's why he chose this approach of working and preaching at weekends. But, you know, I think there was something more going on with Paul here when he arrived in Corinth. <clears throat> a little later, in a letter Corinth, um, to the Corinthians, Paul uses these words to describe about when he came and arrived in Corinth. He said, in weakness and fear and in much trembling, I came to you. We're not exactly sure again what he means by that, but I wonder if Paul, after all that had happened, that busy time, arrived in Corinth, a great city with many things going on and with much godlessness. And I wonder if he was maybe a bit overwhelmed by the culture he saw. Just previously, he had had a severe flogging, not just a flogging, which is bad enough, but the Bible says a severe flogging. And I wonder if that had taken its toll on him physically and emotionally. <clears throat> After that flogging in Philippi, we see other Christians trying to protect Paul and look after his welfare. But when he arrives in Corinth, he's on his own, separated from his colleagues. And it's likely that he faced the same opposition as elsewhere whenever he went to preach. Um, but this time, he was on his own. And in the middle of all that, God speaks to Paul in a vision and says to him, don't be afraid, don't give up, because God will protect him. And God is working in a way that Paul can't even see for himself. I wonder if that's maybe where Paul was, feeling ready to give up. We're not really told. But you see, when we follow God's spirit and mission, we may see amazing things happen but we don't stop being human beings <clears throat> with human limitations. And that's why building good relationships and having strong partnerships in mission is so important. Rest and recovery are important because as human beings, we can't be busy all of the time, even despite the work of the Spirit in our life. 
You know, burnout and emotional stress on the mission field are real things. People trying to adjust to living in a different culture can be a real ongoing problem for many. Not everybody adjusts. Thankfully, many mission organizations now stress the importance of member care, looking after their members. And for, for working cross-culturally, they recognize that it's important to prepare people and train them before they go out. And then when they come back, to do a debriefing to support them. In some cases, too, missionaries need support with counseling and conflict resolution. At Casa Riom, we um, learned some of this the hard way. When missionaries arrived in Casa Riom to work there for a longer period, um, sometimes um, we didn't, they didn't have adequate training and they made mistakes because they didn't understand the culture. And in one case, when there was a breakdown of relationships, um, we tried to fix that from a distance rather than trusting the local leaders um, to put things right and to help. And we actually made things worse. I'm kind of sharing it worse and all here because that's the reality, too, of doing mission. <clears throat> Building relationships and working cross-culturally takes time. <clears throat> One of the organizations, I think we've got a picture of this we partnered with, was Global Connections who helped us put policies in place to better care for people in mission. And I would pray that if anybody decides to go out from our church on mission, that we would make sure we look after them, we look after their welfare, to make sure they're equipped and supported as they go. So that, I believe, was Paul's experience. The scripture seems to, to echo this, that this was a, a very particular time for Paul uh, when he was challenged. You know, but as well as slowing down and addressing human needs, at Corinth, Paul also, also, Paul also experiences a different way of doing mission. So there's something really positive that came out after those difficulties he had. You see, um, what we see Paul do in Corinth was very different from what had gone before in that rush tour of um, the area. This time, when he gets thrown out of the synagogue, he moves next door and sets up a base in the home of a Christian called Titius. You could say that Paul, this time, begins a neighborhood ministry. We read in the story that the leader of the synagogue next door to their base um, somebody called Crispus, becomes a Christian. <clears throat> and Crispus probably lost his job as a result because what we read is he's replaced by another synagogue leader called Sothenus, if that's how you pronounce his name. But Sothenus also becomes a Christian. So the impact of that church is in that local area to the synagogue next door and beyond. And rather than just a short visit in Corinth, we hear that Paul spends 18 months. So he had six months with a whole tour getting to Corinth, but then he spends 18 months living and also working in Corinth. This probably gave him time to build relationships with people. And as he preached and taught, he also lived alongside the people in the local neighborhood. He would have been part of the community working there, but also of the church in that area. You see, 18 months gives time for not just evangelism, but discipleship. And making disciples is what Jesus called us to. Each one of us is asked to make disciples. In Casa Riom, we had to learn about partnership, working with local leaders who were Mozambicans. You know, when the first visitors came back and told us about the situation in Mozambique and said, look, there's not enough space for people. Um, we need to start fundraising for planning new buildings and facilities and we'll have a center outside the town. 
but we hadn't yet fully understood the local culture. We hadn't, we hadn't been embedded in the neighborhood. And over the years, we had to learn to listen and understand the local culture and make decisions in partnership with the staff at Casa Reom. <clears throat> now, the way we work, and I think there's a picture of this, is the local staff have led the way. They've chosen to work by running a school for the poorest children who can't afford to send their children to state schools. And the staff run after-school Bible clubs and do outreach in the community with the parents. All of the staff at Casa Reum have to complete a discipleship training school before they come to the centre because their goal as Christians that the goal is not just to make Christians, but to make disciples. They're in it for the long term. And so now, discipleship and community work go hand in hand. And it's all because those who first came to do mission felt that mission was also about sharing God's love with those who were poor and needy. Uh, in Matthew chapter 25, we remember Jesus' words. He said, when you, when you do something um, to one of others, my people, you're doing it to me. He says, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And those were the verses that really inspired those workers in Castle Reom to be involved in the local neighborhood, to be involved in the community, because they couldn't just make disciples and ignore people's physical needs. Both came hand in hand. So now in Castle Reom, we here in the UK try to work in partnership where the local leaders set the vision and we use our skills to try and help them achieve that vision. I think something happened too in Paul during his time in Corinth that changed him. And I'd like to think there was a different Paul that left Corinth than arrived. Because as well as his human needs being taken care of, he had built, he had time to build significant relationships working in the community, working with other Christians around him. Um, we, we hear at the end of the story that Aquila and Priscilla, remember they're the ones that were the tent makers with him, that he worked with, that they actually left their jobs and went with Paul on the rest of his missionary journey. He must have built quite a relationship with them during that time that they wanted to join him. We also read that Sothenes, do you remember he was the second leader of the synagogue who also became a Christian and got beaten up? He later became a co-worker of Paul. We hear that one of the letters to the Corinthians, Paul says, myself and Sothenes write to you. So he had joined Paul. And we hear that Paul keeps in touch with the church in Corinth and he writes to them addressing them as my brothers and sisters. That time that Paul spent working in community, in relationship with people, had a lasting impact on Paul's life. I like um, the message translation, who finishes this passage in verse 18 with the words, Paul stayed a while longer in Corinth, but then it was time to leave his friends. Those relationships were actually friendships by the time Paul finished in Corinth. I can imagine that the people he worked alongside as mission partners did were more than colleagues and had become friends. So what do we get from this story from Paul? Well, we see that even though the Apostle Paul was used in those amazing ways, those amazing stories of earthquakes, of prison doors flying open of prominent people becoming Christians. He was human 
and he had human weaknesses. He needed to partner with others in the gospel. As we come to a close, I wonder today if maybe you know someone who's involved in mission, maybe somebody you support, somebody you pray for, either here or overseas. I just wonder how you can encourage them, understanding that they are human, they have weaknesses as well. Maybe you've stepped out in mission yourself or stepped out, taken a step to share the gospel even here in the neighborhood and you've not really felt you've had support. Maybe you're feeling on your own now and you need God's encouragement. As, as God said to Paul when he's there, you're not on your own. I have many others in this city. We're encouraged to support each other to partner with each other, to do mission together.